Um, so uh, virtual reality experience consists of you put on a headset, for those of you who haven't tried it, and when you put the headset on, it suddenly seems as if you're not in the room around you. Uh, my favourite virtual reality experience is one where you put the headset on and suddenly it seems you're, as if you're under the sea. And uh, my favourite one is one in which you watch this beautiful jellyfish migration. Uh, so that's the one I'm going to use as my example, just because it's my favourite one. Um, so when you put on the headset, if you look around, um, as you turn your head, it looks as if you're sort of looking in this apparently undersea world. Um, and it looks like a three-dimensional world that surrounds you. So um, my question for tonight is when you have that virtual reality experience, and tonight I'm just going to talk about visual experience, the visual experience with your eyes that you have, although there are very interesting questions to be asked about the auditory experience that you have when you're in virtual reality and whether we can have virtual experiences in other modalities. Could you have a virtual smell experience, for example? These are great questions, but today I want to just think about the visual experience that you have. So when you have a visual experience in virtual reality, does it involve illusory or hallucinatory experience of objects and properties that aren't there? After all, if I'm standing in my lab in Glasgow and I put on this headset and it seems to me that there's a jellyfish in front of me, we know that there's not really a jellyfish in front of me, right? I'm, I'm in the lab in Glasgow and there, there aren't any jellyfish there, just to reassure you. Um, but it seems to me as if there's a jellyfish there. So you might think, well, my experience must be inaccurate in some sense, so it must be illusory or hallucinatory. On the other hand, some philosophers have recently posited that you are having an accurate experience, and that's not because you're seeing the world around you, but you're seeing either virtual or computational objects. After all, if you're seeing a virtual world, then maybe you're seeing accurately the virtual objects that inhabit that world. And so there's this little debate has broken out within philosophy circles about how should we think of the nature of that experience. Is it illusory or hallucinatory on the one hand, because after all, there's not a jellyfish in the lab, or is it an accurate experience, but just of a different object, of some virtual jellyfish, for example? Okay. And what I want to do today is to answer this question uh, in two steps. So the first thing that I want to do is to challenge the traditional account of illusion and hallucination that's been given in philosophy for basically 2,000 years. And in a way, my research on this topic really started by thinking about illusion and hallucination, and really only thinking about that, not thinking about virtual reality experience. And it was only when I sort of started doing some work on virtual reality that I thought, hang on a minute, I could sort of take my theory of illusion and hallucination that I've developed and just kind of ask my theory, what would, what would it say about virtual reality experience? And sort of for the first time in my career, I felt like I had a philosophical plan. So um, when you do philosophy um, as an undergraduate, the very first thing you're ever taught is about Descartes. And one of the lovely things about Descartes, and one of the reasons that we teach it to our undergraduates, is that he had a plan. He had this plan, and he carried it out, and he seemingly got a result. And it all seems very intellectually exciting. So Descartes said, how can I figure out what I really know is in the world around me? And he said, okay, I'm going to have this plan to, to figure that out. I'm going to doubt everything that I can possibly doubt and see if we end up with anything that we cannot doubt. And as we famously know, the thing he thought that we could, uh, uh, well, he thought we could doubt everything apart from the thought that I think, therefore, I exist, right? Cogito ergo sum was his famous phrase. And then once he'd found that I think, therefore, I exist, he tried to then build up from that back to the sort of everyday knowledge that we think that we have. Now, often people think that part of the plan didn't go so well, but it seemed like it, the first part of the plan went really well. He did all this doubting and then he found something he couldn't doubt. And it's kind of misleading to teach undergraduates this bit of philosophy, I think, because Descartes was one of the few people who ever had a plan in philosophy like this. Um, so when I started to think about virtual reality, for the, at the first moment in my career, I felt like I was like a, a proper philosopher like Descartes because I had this plan. I developed this theory of illusion and hallucination, and now all I needed to do was apply it to virtual reality experience and to come up with the right answer. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, tell you about the traditional accounts of illusion and hallucination, tell you why I don't find them good enough, 
and explain what my, what my theory of illusion and hallucination is, and then in the later part of the talk, what we're going to do is apply that theory of illusion and hallucination to virtual reality experience and see what it tells us we should think about it. So that's the plan for the talk. So just to begin then, um, uh, someone actually came up right at the start of, the, of when I was hanging about here and said, what exactly is veridical experience? So a veridical experience is an experience that's accurate about the world um, around you. So at the moment, I'm having experience that represents lots of people sitting in a lecture theatre, and I take it that there really are lots of people sitting in the lecture theatre, fingers <laughs> crossed, um, in front of me. So my experience is a veridical experience. Um, and um, in this case, it's a perceptual experience, so I really am picking up information about the world in perceiving you. And we can contrast that with illusory experience. And so everyone's pretty much agreed that in illusory experience, you are seeing the world. You're just seeing it inaccurately in one or more respects. Whereas in hallucination, you have an experience in which it seems to use if you're seeing the world or perceiving the world. But it merely seems to use if you're seeing the world. You're not seeing or you're not perceiving the world in, in some respect. Okay? Philosophers usually think of a total hallucination, so that everything you're seeing is, halluc is hallucinated. But we know that sometimes people hallucinate single objects within the world that they see. So. Okay, so to begin then, let me try and tell you a little bit about what the traditional accounts of illusion and hallucination are. So here are, here are the standard definitions. So in traditional illusion, you're supposed to perceive some worldly object. And I say some worldly object here because some philosophers think that when you see, there are really mental objects called sense data that you see. So I'm not talking about any special weird philosophical mental object. Right? I'm talking about tables and chairs and people and cameras and computers and so on. So according to the traditional definition of illusion, you perceive some worldly object, but you misperceive one or more of its properties. So, for example, you might be looking at a blue car, but there's funny street lighting, uh, lighting up your street, and so you don't have an experience as of a blue car, you maybe have an experience of a purple car. So you're seeing the car, but inaccurately so in some respect, in this respect, vis-a-vis -vis its colour. But of course, you might be inaccurately seeing it on an occasion because you see it as mislocated, maybe you see it as being shifted over here when it's really here, or maybe you see the shape as uh, distorted in some way. Okay. So here's a quote from uh, a philosopher, contemporary philosopher, A.D. Smith. He says, illusion is any perceptual situation in which a physical object is actually perceived, but in which that object perceptually appears other than it really is. So this is just the standard account of illusion that everyone thus far really has bought into. So, in contrast to the case of illusion, here's the traditional account of hallucination that people give. So you have an experience as of an object and its properties, but there really is no worldly object and there are no worldly properties that you're perceiving in virtue of having that experience. So just to give you an example again, so you might have an experience as of a blue car, but you're not, in virtue of having that experience, seeing a blue car or indeed any other worldly object. You're having this experience, but you're not seeing a car. Now, one thing that's really important to note is the case of what's called veridical hallucination. So, for the most part, when people hallucinate, their experiences are inaccurate, right? So, when Mac Macbeth hallucinated and he asked, is this a dagger I see before me? The question was, no, there's no dagger there, right? And that was sort of his clue to knowing that he was hallucinating. But I might sort of play a, a hideous trick on, on Macbeth. I might ask him, what the, what's this dagger like that you keep seeing? Um, and he might tell me about its nature and so on. And I might go off and get one made that exactly replicated the one that he seems to see when he has these hallucinations. And at the point where he says to me, you know, Fiona, here I am hallucinating this dagger again. I might run in with the dagger and place it right in front of him in the very spot where he seems to be hallucinating the dagger. Now, in this weird situation, he would be having a veridical hallucination. He wouldn't be seeing the dagger, but his experience would be representing the world accurately. It would be representing the fact that there really was a dagger in front of him. Okay. So we've got to note that special case of veridical hallucination. Okay. 
So before we proceed, it's important for me just to tell you a little bit about the standard philosophical account of perception. Now, there are lots of different accounts, and particularly different philosophical accounts of perception. Um, but for our purposes, if we understand this standard account, then we can use this to try and motivate my own theory of illusion and hallucination and do more than just back up certain intuitions that I'm going to try and elicit from you about various cases in which I'm going to ask you to uh, say whether you think they're perception or illusion or hallucination. Okay. So, first of all, according to the standard account of perception, when we have perceptual experiences, those are experiences that represent the world to be a certain way. So, at the moment, if I were to describe my visual experience to you, I would say, well, I'm seeing a lecture theatre and I'm seeing chairs and various people sitting in it. And in so doing, I'm describing what my perceptual experience represents the world to be about. And you might think that, and a lot of philosophers do think, that there's not much more you could ever say to get across the nature of your experience other than say what it represented. If I wanted to say in more detail what my experience might be, might be like, I might say, well, the chairs are blue and they're over there and they're this shape and, and so on and so forth. But I'd just be saying more about what the experience represented. Perhaps one exception to that would be to talk about the modality of the experience was an experience of seeing or hearing or tasting or smelling and so on. But apart from the modality, really the way we get across information about what our experience is like is by saying what they represent, what their experience is of. Okay. So uh, this account seems quite intuitive because when we go to describe our experiences, what we end up doing is describing what they represent, what they're about. Now, as well as a kind of commitment to this idea that our perceptual experiences represent the world around us, another kind of key constraint about what happens, about what goes on when you perceive the world, is that you consciously perceive the world if and only if you have some conscious perceptual experience that at least closely matches the way the world is in front of you. And, moreover, that your experience is caused in the right way by the world. Now, the reason for that extra clause goes back to thinking about the case of veridical hallucination. Just because you have a, an experience that matches the way the world is, that doesn't tell you yet whether you're hallucinating or whether you're seeing the world. Because, of course, you could be in this strange situation where what you hallucinate just so happens to be what's out there in the world in front of you. So people usually add this causal clause to make sure, if you like, that there's a connection between you and the world, to make sure that it's because the world is the way it is that you're having the experience that you're having. In other words, that your experience is sensitive to the world so that you can be truly said to be gathering information about the world, and that's thought to be necessary for perception. So the thought is, there has to be this causal connection between yourself and the world, and your experience has to at least closely match the way the world is, in order for you to be said to perceive the world. Okay. And on this account, to say there's an experience that matches the world is just to say that your experience represents the world accurately or correctly. Another way of saying that in philosophy and kind of technical jargon is to say that the content, i.e. what your experience represents, is correct. And as I've just said, you need to add into that correctness condition, you need to add that there's a causal connection to the world so that you're genuinely picking up information about the way the world is. Okay, so what I want to do is to show you that if you buy into this standard theory of perception, then that standard theory will match up with what I take to be my accurate intuitions and what hope will be your intuitions too about how we should think about certain quite exotic cases of perception that might stray into cases of being illusion and hallucination. Okay, so just to talk you through a, a sort of standard case of what of uh, veridical perception. So imagine that there's a blue car and you're accurately seeing the blue car. So you're seeing the colour right, you're seeing its location right, you're seeing its shape right. Just a standard case of perception. So according to the standard theory, you would be perceiving the car if and only if you have an experience that matches the object and the properties in front of you. And you can see up here that here's a car in the world and here's uh, my representation of your experience of the car. And you can see the experience, if you like, matches the way the world is. And moreover, we've got to say that the uh, experience must be caused in the right way by the object that you're seeing. Okay. 
So what is it for the experience to be caused in the right way? Well, good question. Well, it turns out that there are lots and lots of different philosophical accounts of how we should describe that. But sort of at base, what most people agree is that the causal connection must be one of a kind so as to allow you to track objects and properties across a wide variety of perceptual situations, such that if the car drove away and another car replaced it, your experience would change and would update to reflect the nature of the car that was now in front of you. So in other words, what we want to do is to avoid that it's just luck making it the case that your experience is accurately representing the world, as was the case with Macbeth's dagger when I ran out and got this funny dagger made and ran in with it, so that you're being sensitive to the way the world is in general. Okay. So in a case of veridical perception, where you're accurately seeing the world, these conditions must hold. You must have an accurate experience and have the right sort of causal connection to the world. Okay. So... That is the kind of standard account. If you went to Philosophy 101 in Perception, we'd tell you all this stuff in a bit more detail and think about objections and so on and so forth. But why do I think that this account of illusion and hallucination that I've given you thus far isn't correct? Well, intuitively, the idea is that I can set up a variety of strange cases of illusion and hallucination that, first of all, the traditional theory just would have nothing to say about them, or second of all, they would miss important differences between cases that our intuitions will say, actually, we need to mark those differences. In other words, the traditional theory just elides certain differences that we need to make sure are, are noted. Okay. So, just to get our intuitions up and running, I want to start with a simple case. So, intuitively, I think we can distinguish between cases of what I'm going to call property illusion from cases that are, I'm going to call property hallucination that are all taking place while we're actually perceiving an object. Now, remember, according to the standard account, if you're perceiving an object and just getting one of its properties wrong, all those cases should count as cases of illusion. But what I'm saying is, well, some of those cases might be illusion, but actually we should be classifying some of those cases as hallucination and not as illusion. And that's why I think, in part, this is the first step in unpicking why the traditional theory gets things wrong. And moreover, we can back up that intuition with insights from this traditional causal theory of perception that I've just outlined to you. So in other words, what I'm going to introduce to you is a distinction between illusion and hallucination that the traditional theory just doesn't allow for. Okay, so here's the kinds of cases that I want us to think about. The intuitive contrast is between, on the one hand, a case in which you're sensitive to some property so that you can genuinely count as seeing that property, but imperfectly so, so that it's not just a case of accurate or veridical perception. And on the other hand, a case in which you're not sensitive to a property at all, so that you don't really count as seeing it full stop. So here's the example. So imagine that you wear dark glasses, right? Here you are, looking at a light blue car, and you stick on your dark glasses, and you have an experience as of a car, pretty much the right location, the right shape, but you see it as, a, as having a slightly darker color than it really has, okay? In this case, you would experience um, objects and all of their visible properties accurately, except for their colour, which you would experience as systematically skewed. You would see everything as being a little bit darker than it really is, because you've got the glasses on. So I would say that this is a case where you're actually perceiving the colour of the car, but just in a systematically skewed or illusory manner. Why are you seeing it is because you're sensitive to the colour that the car is. If the car changed colour, your experience would change. If it changed from blue to red, your experience would change. You would, you would see it changing colour. You're sensitive to the way the colours are. So intuitively, I think this is a case of misperception. And in addition, the conditions on perception that we just discussed above are fulfilled. So you're having a closely matching experience of a slightly darker car than the car that you're in front of one, than, than is really in front of you. So you're having a closely matching experience. And moreover, the causal connection between the colour of the car and your experience will allow you to track 
that colour and other colours in a wide variety of scenes. Just because you're wearing dark glasses, it doesn't stop you seeing the colours of things. So that would be a case of property illusion. So contrast that case with the following case, which I think is a case of property hallucination. So imagine that you experience objects as coloured, but which object, sorry, but which colour you experience the object as having is completely random. And why is that? Because we imagine that some evil scientist is zapping the area V4 of your visual cortex, which we know is responsible for you experiencing colour. So here you are, strapped up to the evil scientist's chair, and you're looking at a light blue car, and on this occasion, let's say, you experience it as being purple. Why do you experience it as being purple? Because the evil scientist is doing what he's doing to your visual cortex. So in this case, you're not responsive to which object, so to which colour objects have. So for example, in this condition, if the car changed colour, you would continue to experience it as being purple because the evil scientist is doing what he's doing. You're not sensitive to the colour that the car has. So in these circumstances, you look at a car, you experience it accurately, except for the fact that you experience it as being purple when it is in fact blue. And you're not, though, tracking colours in your environment in any sense, but you are tracking everything else that's standardly visible. So I would say that you're seeing the car, you're seeing its location, you're seeing its shape, but in no sense at all are you seeing its colour. The, the colour you experience it as having is completely dependent on what the evil scientist is up to and not what the colours of objects are in the world. So I would say that this is a case of object perception but property hallucination. And that's just a case that the standard theory of illusion and hallucination can't accommodate. Okay. So the conclusion thus far is that intuitively there's this distinction between property illusion on the one hand and property hallucination on the other hand that happen in nonetheless in cases where you really are perceiving an object. And that's just a, a distinction that the traditional account of illusion and hallucination elides. And so it's not a good account. Okay. And moreover, what I've shown you is you can back up that intuition using material from a standard causal theory of perception. You can explain why we should think that way. Now, at this point, you might have a worry in, about what I've been saying. So you might sort of ask me, look, Fiona, what's the criterion at play for saying that there's a closely matching experience? After all, in the kind of case I gave you of closely matching, you were wearing sunglasses and there's a light blue car, you put on your sunglasses, you saw it was dark blue. Well, intuitively, that is closely matching, but what does it take to, for something to be closely matching? How, how close does this matching have to be and what exactly does closely matching consist in? So one answer you might try to give here is that the experiences uh, you have when you wear the sunglasses is phenomenally quite similar with respect to the experience that you would have if you didn't have the sunglasses on and you were seeing the car accurately. So you might think, well, you've just got to look at the experiences and judge is the experience similar or not? But I don't think that's a very good answer. So it still doesn't answer, well, how similar? What if you saw the car as purple? What if you saw it as red? What if you saw it as looking like a bird? At what point do you say, well, that's not close enough matching? And surely we want to allow for some cases of illusion where the illusion might be really quite radical. So there's a, a case where, uh, that philosophers think about a lot. Imagine you had a pair of inverting uh, colour lenses, such that when you put them on, you saw everything as having this sort of complementary colour than the colour it really has. So for example, you wouldn't see the sky as blue, but it's being yellow. You wouldn't see red flowers as being red, but being green. So you, for every sort of colour in the colour wheel, you would see the opposite one. A lot of people think, well, you would still be tracking the colours, it would just be that it was quite a radical or, or quite a big illusion that was taking place. And if we went for something like, well, the experience has got to seem quite similar to you, you wouldn't, be able, you wouldn't get to count that case as a case of illusion. So I hold that what's required for there to be a closely matching experience is that there's a suitable causal relationship between the experience and the environment, and moreover, that you would be able to form some correct judgments about the property in question on the basis of taking the set of the, the illusory experiences that you would have in the particular illusory condition, like wearing the sunglasses, which you would have 
Um, if you took those experiences at face value, you would be able to make some true judgments about the, um, the property in question. So in the case of looking at the light blue car and wearing the dark sunglasses, you'd be able to make the following accurate judgments. Um, if you just took your experiences as telling you accurately about the world, the car is blue, the car is darker in colour than my car, if it was sitting beside yours. Uh, that car is more similar in colour to my car than it is to your car, and so on. So wearing the sunglasses, you'd still be able to make lots of true judgments about properties. And for me, that would count, therefore, as close enough and matching to count uh, this case as illusion. So this kind of thing would allow there to be large, systematic kinds of illusion, um, and I think that that's a, a good feature of the account. But now, on the other hand, you might think, well, maybe I've gone kind of too far the other way. Maybe, I've, maybe my definition is now too liberal and would count too many cases as being cases of illusion, cases that we would, would want to say, they don't even count as seeing the world at all. They should really be cases of hallucination. So in other words, perhaps this account that I've given you entails that too many cases of systematic mismatch would count as cases of illusion when we really shouldn't count them as such, even cases that intuitively would not be. So I want you to imagine the following strange circumstance. Suppose that whenever you look at a patch of colour, instead of seeing the colour, you had some kind of smell experience, right? some olfactory experience. Okay? Now, suppose that when you were faced with different colours, you would have systematically different smell experiences, one smell experience corresponding to each uh, colour. You might think intuitively that there's no way in this world that we should ever count an olfactory experience as being one that closely matches a colour experience. After all, I chose this example to be as, about as different as, uh, as we could possibly get. But of course, my definition would rule that some such cases are cases of illusion, as long as you could make some true judgments about the world on the basis of those experiences. So suppose um, when faced with red and then orange and then yellow, you had systematically, when faced with red, a very strongly fruity smell, and then when faced with orange, you had a mediumly fruity smell experience, and then when faced with yellow, you had a very mild, fruity, olfactory experience. This would obviously be a, a rather strange kind of situation. In this case, you'd have a systematic mismatch between the smell experiences and the colour experiences, but you would be able to make some true judgments about the world if you took your olfactory experiences at face value. Judgments of the form A is more similar to B than it is to C. Well, of course, red is more similar to orange than it is to yellow. Okay. So as a result, the worry is that my definition is going to count too many cases as being cases uh, of illusion, cases which you might think, you know, you, you can't count as seeing colours in virtue of having an olfactory experience. Okay. So what should I say in response to this? Well, I think the first thing to note is that being of a close match admits of degree. So whether my experience matches the, the world, well, there can be more similar ones and there can be less similar ones. And in different cases, there are going to be more or fewer accurate judgments that you can make about the world on the basis of taking your experiences at face value. Thus, I think exactly where someone wants to draw the line and say, OK, you need to be able to make the, this number of true judgments about the world in order to count as, per as perception, and where someone says, well, yeah, that's not enough true judgments that you can make here that shouldn't count as perception, I'm quite happy to think that people might vary as to where they want to draw that line. In other words, I think that the distinction between illusion and hallucination is really one of degree. And I'm proposing that we put the line at a certain point, well, if you can make some true judgment, let's count that as seeing. But I can understand why people might say, yeah, actually, you need to be able to make more true judgments than that. But I predict, and in fact, uh, empirical research uh, amongst philosophers suggests that actually people's intuitions vary about this colour smell case. Some people say, no, no, that could be a way of, of perceiving the world by having these systematic smell experiences in response to colour. And I think that that kind of case is really on the cusp between illusion and hallucination, because the number of true judgments that you can make about the environment 
based on taking your experience at face value, are incredibly limited. They're limited only to relative judgments. You know, A is more similar to B and so on. But that's what you're limited to. There's no further true judgments you can make in that case on the basis of your experience. But I actually think it's a strength of my theory that it kind of predicts and explains why people's intuitions about this case will be kind of mixed, why some people say, yeah, that counts as perception and why not? Um, so I kind of like this account, and if we want to sort of argue about exactly where to draw the line, I'm quite comfortable with thinking that there's room for argument there. But I think that the general framework is exactly right. And nothing I say really turns on putting the line just exactly there, as long as you're happy with the general methodology of putting the line somewhere based on how close of a match is your experience to the way the world is. Okay. So in philosophy, as soon as you discover a new case, my sort of uh, technique for thinking further about things is to try and start drawing up tables and trying to think about, well, what other weird cases might be out there. So up here we have this uh, table uh, where we have uh, basically what this represents is an ex experiences as of objects all having certain properties. And you can see here that here we have a standard veridical accurate experience of the world where you veridically perceive an object and you veridically perceive one of that object's properties experienced as belonging to that object in question. So that's just a standard case of seeing the world accurately. And then here's the traditional illusion case where you're veridically perceiving the object, but you're having illusory perception of one of the object's properties experienced as belonging to that object. And what we've done thus far is to say, well, actually, we need a box here that we can put a tick in where you're perceiving an object, but just having a hallucination of one of its properties, the case where the evil scientist is zapping your content. And then we find that traditional hallucination lives in a box over here where you're hallucinating an object and you're hallucinating um, a property as belonging to that object. But immediately this opens up this kind of logical space here. Well, could you have cases where you hallucinate an object and you have veridical or illusory perception of one of that hallucinated object's properties experienced as belonging to it? Now, most philosophers would think, that's the most bizarre. How could you ever do up a case like that? I and mean, how could you talk about accurate property perception of a hallucinated object? That just seems bizarre. Okay, so interesting cases to think about. And then also, we've got veridical perception of an object and hallucinatory uh, experience of an object. Could you ever have illusory perception of an object? Well, I want to convince you that it kind of ticks in all of these boxes. And to start, I want to start about talking about cases of how you could have cases of illusory perception of an object. This is just a, a set of cases that the traditional accounts of veridical, illusory or hallucinatory perception just don't ever mention or ever think could exist. And I want to try and persuade you that they could exist. Okay. Now at this point you might be starting to think, it's going on a lot, a lot about weird cases in philosophy. And I am going on a lot about weird cases in philosophy, but we'll see that there's a really nice payoff when it comes to thinking about virtual reality. We'll see that some of these kind of bizarre cases that seem, why are we bothering thinking about those? We'll see that actually, when it comes to a, a virtual reality experience, we're going to discover that virtual reality experience is like a lot of these weird cases that we're discovering, uh, that we're discussing just now. Okay. So, how could we think of what an illusory experience of an object would be? Well, my account of veridical and illusory object perception turned on the idea that in both cases, there's got to be this suitable causal relationship between your experience and the environment. The difference is that in veridical perception, you form wholly accurate judgments about the way the world is if you took your experience at face value, whereas in the case of illusion, at least some of the judgments you make will be false about the way the world is. Okay. Now, you can apply that idea to object perception. So here's how I do it. Think of someone, or a, yeah, a detector, or a machine, or a person who, could, who was an object detector. If you're an object detector, you could be a better or worse object detector. You could be really accurate at detecting the presence of objects, or you could be really very bad at detecting the presence of objects. Okay? If I'm a perfect object detector, I will detect objects when and only when there are objects present. And of course, people aren't perfect object detectors. We make some mistakes, like when we hallucinate, we think there are objects in front of us when there aren't. Okay? 
But consider someone who had some form of systematically skewed object perception. For example, suppose that they systematically experienced two objects as being present for every one object that really was present. So imagine that they have a kind of form of double vision. Okay? Now, most of us have double vision. If you take your finger and you look at it and you stare at it and you pull it up really close to your eye, there's a point at which it suddenly seems as if there's two semi-transparent fingers floating in front of your face. Um, so we're kind of familiar with a form of double vision. But in this kind of situation, we're not really tempted to think that there are two objects there, basically because you know what's going on, and, and both fingers look semi-transparent. They don't look like real solid fingers in front of you. Okay? But imagine an idealised version of double vision in which the two objects that you experienced were opaque, just like your normal experience of a finger, um, and, and each seemed... So imagine that I'm looking at one finger here, but I experienced, let's say, one finger, one inch on either side of where the actual finger is. Okay? So you might think that experience of one of these fingers amounts to seeing the finger that's really there and the other one doesn't. Maybe it's a hallucination of that finger or something like that. That's a possibility. But the problem with that view would be to choose which one's the hallucination and which one's the real deal, which one's really perceiving that finger. Especially if each one was, you know, an inch on either side of the finger and each one in other respects looked exactly like the finger in front of you. So I think in, this kind, in these kinds of cases, it's more plausible to say that the experience of each object, the two apparent fingers, amounts to perception of the object. What's going on is that you're seeing your finger twice in virtue of having these apparently experience of two fingers. Each one amounts to seeing an object. And that's a view that um, the philosopher E.J. Lowe um, uh, advocated. And I think, that, I think that this is right. I think this is a good account of, of this kind of double vision. So in double vision, there's going to be a suitable causal relationship between your experience and the environment that leads to systematic skewing. For every one object present, you'll see two. Okay? So there's going to be, you're going to be tracking objects just in a systematically incorrect way, you see, for two, for every one that's there. Taking your experience at face value, of course you'll form many incorrect judgments about what's out there in the world, right? So if I'm holding up this number of fingers, and when it, if I took my experience at face value and I had double vision, I would say, well, there are six fingers there, and obviously that's going to be false, right? But I will be able to make lots of correct judgments, such as, there are twice as many objects here as there are here. Right? So, in this kind of case, where there's a systematic skewing of your experience of objects, in this case, double vision, I would say this is a case of object illusion. You're seeing the object, but in an illusory fashion. You're seeing two objects for every one that's there. And again, this is a case that the standard theory of illusion just doesn't account for, doesn't even think exists. Okay, so I think that we can put a tick in this box. There are cases of illusory perception of an object, and of course there'll be cases where you veridically perceive some of the properties of that object. So if you're having double vision of the finger, you might perceive the colour of the finger right. You might have illusory perception of one of its properties. So for example, you might be wearing dark glasses and see the colour uh, in a systematically skewed way. And of course you could be having a hallucination of the colour of the finger when you're seeing it in this double vision form because some evil scientist is zapping your brain and causing you to experience the, the finger as purple in some way that's unrelated to the colour that the finger really has. Okay, so I think we can put ticks in all of these boxes and now we come to think about, well, what's going on here? Well, before I tell you about what's going on here, I have to tell you about another weird case. Okay. Philosophers like weird cases. Okay, so thus far we've talked about veridical perception of one of an object's properties, experience as belonging to the object. Now, why have I been stressing that? Well, that's because you can imagine cases um, where you could have veridical perception of another object's property experienced as belonging to a first object. Okay? So let me try and explain that kind of case to you before we get on to these um, uh, hallucinatory cases. So suppose the following. 
Suppose every time you see an object at the centre of the left-hand side of your visual field, you perceive it accurately except for its colour. Suppose that the colour you experience that object as having depends on the colour of the object that's really at the centre of the right-hand side of your visual field. Okay? So imagine here I am, uh, and in the centre of uh, the left-hand side of my visual field is a car, and let's suppose I perceive that accurately in all respects, except for the fact that I misperceive its colour. What colour do I experience the car as having? Let's suppose that that's determined by what's over here, in this case a red tomato. So uh, I experience the car as being red. In this case, you're suitably causally sensitive to the left-hand object and all of its visible properties, except for its colour, so you're suitably sensitive to its shape and its location and so on. And you're suitably sensitive to the colour of the right-hand object, the colour of the tomato. It's just that you incorrectly attribute the colour of the tomato to the car. You incorrectly attribute the colour of the right-hand object to the left-hand object, creating a non-veridical experience. You experience a car, car as being red when it's not. Well, you might think, as we've said thus far, you know, surely you, you've kind of left the planet now, Fiona, right? I mean, you know, this is such a bizarre case that you're describing. Why do we need to think about this case? Well, actually, we know that there are real-life cases like this that psychologists dis uh, discover in the, the laboratory. So there's a very famous case called uh, Cases of Failures of Binding, which are just like this. So if I showed you a red uh, square next to a green circle, but I showed you that for a very short period of time, you're highly likely to report to me seeing a green square next to a red circle. And so what's going on is that you're detecting the colours and you're detecting the shapes. Nobody suddenly reports seeing a blue triangle, right? You're detecting the shapes, you're detecting the colours, but you're sticking them together, if you like, in the wrong way. Well, that kind of case is exactly the sort of case I'm describing. And what I like about this is that based on philosophical expo exploration of what's the logical space of all the possible cases you could, you could find, you actually find a real-life case like this, it's non-veridical perception, it's illusory, but the standard theory of illusion and hallucination doesn't account for this case at all. And I think that that's why my theory is good, because it allows us to account for these unusual cases. If you want to read more about failures of binding, um, the standard reference is uh, Anne Treesman and colleagues. Okay. okay. So what we've done then is put a tick in this box here, where you were veridically perceiving an object, um, in this case the car, and you were experiencing and perceiving another object's colour as belonging to that first object. Okay, so can we put a tick in this box here? Could you have a case of hallucinating an object, but perceiving an object's property as belonging to that hallucinated object? I think we can. So again, Suppose that at times you randomly visually hallucinate an object at the centre of your visual field, and let's suppose at other times you experience nothing. And imagine that when you so hallucinate, none of the properties that you experience the hallucinated object as having are dependent on the way that the objects are in front of you in the world, except one. Let's suppose that the colour of the object that you hallucinate is actually determined by the colour of the object that really is in front of you in the centre of your visual field. So let's suppose that there's some evil scientist that zaps your brain from time to time that causes you to randomly hallucinate some object, in this case a pig. But let's suppose that in those conditions, for whatever reason that we care to elaborate on, the object that really is at the centre of your visual field, in this case a green house, is such that you detect its colour, but you attribute the colour of the house to the pig, so that you experience a green pig. Okay. I would say that what's going on here is that your hallucination of the pig is not counterfactually sensitive to whether there's an object in front of you because you have experiences of these objects at random based on what the evil scientist is doing to your brain, but your experience matches perfectly and is counterfactually sensitive to the colour of the object that's at the centre of your visual field, in this case, the green house. Thus, you hallucinate an object, 
but you veridically perceive the colour in front of you and you inaccurately attribute it to the hallucinated object. And that is exactly this case here. So now we've got this case in question and ready to try and talk you through these rather, <laughs> the most bizarre cases of all, if you like, thus far. So suppose at certain times you randomly visually hallucinate an object at the centre of your visual field and at other times you experience nothing. And imagine that when you so hallucinate, like the last case, none of the properties that you experience the object as having are dependent on the objects in front of you in the environment except one. Let's suppose, again, that the colour of the object that you hallucinate is determined by the colour of the surface that's really in front of you. But imagine that it just so happens that when the evil scientist zaps your brain and you hallucinate at random, let's suppose you hallucinate Michelangelo's David, let's suppose it really was Michelangelo's David in this occasion that was in front of you in the world, and that you experienced the whiteness of the marble, and you attributed that colour to Michelangelo's David. This would be a case where you're hallucinating an object, but you're veridically perceiving a property of that object experienced as belonging to the hallucinated object. Okay, so we can put a tick in this box. And of course, you could imagine a similar case where you perceive the colour of the object, but just in a systematically skewed way, because, for example, you were wearing dark glasses. Now, I'll let you fill in this box for yourselves. Now that you know the general way of trying to find these cases, I'll leave that one uh, to you. But actually, our table is hiding a whole bunch of other exotic cases. Because here I've been discussing veridical perception of another object's property, experiences belonging to an object. But of course, basically, you could have veridical, illusory, or hallucinatory perception of one of an object's properties, experiences belonging veridically or illusorily or hallucinatorily to another object. So there's a whole bunch of cases that you can pack in there as well. Right, so far so good. That was the, the, the theory that I came up with about various kinds of illusion and hallucination that the standard theory didn't account for. And now the question is, suppose you take that, that account and you now turn to look at virtual reality experience. What does that account tell you about what's going on in virtual reality experience? So are the sorts of current visual experiences that we have in virtual reality while using devices like the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive, other devices and makes are available, um, are they on the one hand illusory or hallucinatory or are they veridical perceptual experiences of virtual or computational objects? Well discussion in the contemporary philosophical literature makes it seem like the answer is one or the other. They're either the veridical of these virtual objects or they're illusory or hallucinatory because you know, there aren't jellyfish in my, in my office when I put on the um, VR headset. So here's someone, just uh, a, a very famous philosopher, some of you may have heard of him, David Chalmers. He's written a paper recently in 2017 called The Virtual and the Real. He says, the most common view is that virtual reality is a sort of fictional or illusory reality, and that what goes on in virtual reality is not truly real. This view naturally goes along with the view that experiences in virtual reality are illusory. Okay? He says, I will defend the opposite view. Virtual reality is a sort of genuine reality. Virtual objects are real objects, and what goes on in virtual reality is truly real. And experiences in virtual reality are non-illusory. In other words, they're veridical experiences of virtual objects. So there's the debate set up for you. Okay? Now, I think that this conception of the debate doesn't, for a start, take a proper account of the way the contemporary technology works. And secondly, I think it has a really metaphysically impoverished conception of illusion and hallucination, because it has the traditional account in mind. And so I think that once we apply my more complex view, we'll see that things are far more complicated than are, are traditionally thought. Therefore, the standard conception of the debate presents us with a false dichotomy. It's either all veridical or virtual objects, or it's all illusory or hallucinatory because those objects are merely virtual. Thus, I think that the modern debate really fails to understand and appreciate the complexity of virtual reality experience. 
So why do I think that it doesn't take proper account of the way that the contemporary technology works? Well, virtual reality experience, when you put the headset on and you experience that you're under the world, uh, sorry, under the water, uh, looking at jellyfish and so on, um, it doesn't just involve an experience of a virtual world. It also involves perceiving the two screens that are mounted on the inside of the headset. So when you look at one of these headsets close up, there's a screen here and there's a screen here, and when you put it up against your face, your left eye sees one screen and your right eye sees the other screen. Okay? And I think it's really useful in thinking of virtual reality experience to start by comparing and contrasting it to a series of far more familiar uh, experiences that we're all far more used to having. So think about seeing a picture or watching a film of a real world event, right? So imagine that you're watching uh, The Blue Planet and David Attenborough has filmed a jellyfish migration and there you are sitting at home watching the jellyfish migration on television, a really commonplace event. This is a perfect model of indirect perception. You see the jellyfish migration that David Attenborough filmed in virtue of seeing something else, in virtue of seeing your television screen. Okay? As was mentioned, I'm a Partick Thistle fan. Occasionally I get to see Partick Thistle playing a football match on television. I get to see the game in virtue of watching my television screen. So I see one thing in virtue of seeing another thing. Okay? In this case where David Attenborough is filming the jellyfish, you indirectly see the jellyfish in virtue of directly seeing your television screen. And what's true of that kind of case of indirect perception is that if you weren't seeing the screen, you wouldn't be seeing the jellies. It turns out that if you're a jellyfish expert, you call jellyfish jellies and not jellyfish because jellyfish aren't fish. That's my little bit of jellyfish trivia for you. So now consider what happens when you see a 3D movie or a 3D image. Basically, it consists of what's called a stereogram, or in the case of a movie or a film, lots of stereograms in quick succession, which basically is two offset two-dimensional images, one displayed to each eye of the viewer. And there are lots of ways to do this. If, like me, you're a child of the 70s, you will remember this wonderful device, the Viewmaster, right? So there's a card that you slot in, and basically at opposite sides of the card, there are two images that are very similar to each other. One's just offset a little bit from the other, and you look through, and you don't see, you know, one eye is looking at one image, and one eye is looking at the other image. We don't see two images. You have an experience of one three-dimensional world. Okay? So it's like one eye sees this, one eye sees this, but you see a three-dimensional jellyfish. And many of you will have been to 3D movies at the cinema. The way that works is that they basically put a kind of bluish image and a reddish image of the same object overlaid on each other, and then you get these very uh, sexy glasses to wear. Uh, one has a blue filter that uh, makes it such that the blue image doesn't reach this eye. One has a red filter which makes it such that the red image doesn't see, reach this eye, so that each eye sees a different image. But of course, you don't appreciate that you're seeing that each eye is looking at two images. Rather, you just have this one experience of a three-dimensional jellyfish. So clearly in these kinds of cases, you don't have an experience that represents two two-dimensional objects. You have an experience of one three-dimensional object. Of course, information from those two two-dimensional objects is being picked up by your eyes and your brain. Right? If you weren't picking up information about the images on the screen, you wouldn't be seeing what you were seeing. So what's going on is that systematically your experience represents one scene in front of you, one jellyfish in front of you, when really two are present. Now you should be thinking, what does that sound like? Well, I think this is the reverse of double vision. This is half vision. For every two objects present, you see one. <clears throat> So, as your experience is counterfactually sensitive to the images in front of you, we have good grounds for saying that you're seeing those images, but qua the objects of perception, you're seeing those objects in an illusory fashion. You're seeing half the number present than are really present. So that's thinking about object perception, but what's going on with the property perception in these kinds of stereogram cases? Are there any features that are experienced accurately? Well, what about the shape of the jellies? 
Well, arguably, yes. The outline shape of the um, of the jellyfish in the two two dimensional models gets transferred and becomes the outline shape of the one three dimensional jellyfish that you apparently experience. So the outline shape of the jellies is accurately perceived. You're counterfactually sensitive to it. If it changes, your experience will change too. So this is a case of veridical perception of an object's property, in this case its shape, experienced as belonging to an object that's illusorily perceived because you have this kind of half vision qua objects. So in other words, we can put a tick in this box. It's illusory perception because it's half vision, but you're accurately perceiving the shape of the object. And are there any features that are experienced inaccurately? Well, yes, the location of the images is inaccurately experienced. There's one image here and there's one image here, but you see a three-dimensional jellyfish here in front of you. Okay. So this would be a case of illusory perception of one of an object's properties experienced as belonging to an illusory perceived object. So here we get to put a tick in this box vis-a-vis -vis the objects on the screen that are in front of you. Okay. Now suppose these images were generated by David Attenborough filming a real world event of a jellyfish swimming under the Pacific Ocean. You would thereby be seeing, I suppose it's a movie rather than a still photo, you would thereby be seeing the event of the jellyfish swimming in this indirect fashion in virtue of seeing the two images that are each shown to each eye. So this is a case of indirect perception. You're seeing the real world event of the jellies swimming in virtue of seeing the succession of two images that are shown to each eye. In this case, your experience is counterfactually sensitive to and accurate about many features of the jellyfish. We could set things up so that you see the shape of the jellyfish accurately by seeing the TV, you see its colour accurately, and so on. But of course it's going to be inaccurate about its location. So when you're sitting watching the TV, it looks like the jellyfish is right there in front of you. But of course the jellyfish that you're seeing was swimming away on the Pacific Ocean, which might be over there somewhere. So you're going to be inaccurate about the location of the object. You're going to be inaccurate about the time of the object uh, swimming. It was filmed three months ago, and here you are today sitting watching the jellyfish. So, but you're going to be right about the temporal order. So, you know, the jellyfish swims like this, and you're seeing the right, you know, the, the order in which it swam and the order in which it moved its jellyfish bits. I, don't know. <laughs> I never thought I would be imitating a jellyfish standing up here. Okay, so you get the you get the idea. So there's going to be um, you're going to be veridically perceiving the object, the jellyfish, qua object. There was one jellyfish, and you're experiencing one jellyfish. And then you're going to have a mixture of veridical perception of its properties, say its shape and its colour, illusory perception of its properties, say the location of the object and, and the order of the timing. And some of, of the properties will just be hallucinatory, like the time of occurrence of the swimming. So you can see here that we've got this quite complicated picture. Vis-a-vis -vis the objects on the screen, we've got these boxes ticked. Vis a vis the jellyfish swimming under the sea, we've got this object, uh, we've got these boxes ticked. Moreover, we've got a case of indirect perception. So you're seeing or experiencing certain of the jellyfish's properties in virtue of perceiving the properties of the objects on the screen. So basically, you have veridical and illusory perception of another object's properties, the screen, experienced as belonging either in a veridical, illusory, or hallucinatory fashion, um, uh, belonging to the, the jellyfish. So basically, we get to put a tick in this box, and this now explains the indirect perception. Now, if the images that you were seeing were generated by a computer rather than being generated by a filming of the jellyfish under the water, then the options that are cited in the literature for what you're experiencing are either some non-existent illusory or hallucinated jelly or a veridical experience of a virtual or digital jelly. Okay. So here's what David Chammer says about that second option. That's the option that he likes. He says... What you see are digital objects. To a first approximation, they can be regarded as data structures located in the computer. Okay. So here's Tamara's view. The data structures perceived are the ones that produce the experiences of the objects in VR. 
So the, the idea is something like this. Suppose you put the headset on and you're experiencing three jellyfish. The idea is that there will be a data structure in the computer corresponding, if you like, one-on-one -on -one to each of the jellyfish. And to the extent that you're experiencing the virtual jellyfish, you're just experiencing, according to Chalmers, these data structures in the computer. According to my account, what should we say about this, about what's going on here? Well, I would say that we would veridically perceive the data structures qua objects if the right sort of tracking exists, if there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of jellyfish or objects that you see in virtual reality and the number of data structures that are producing those objects. And of course, in some computational setups, you could ensure that that was happening. Okay? It needn't happen. VR needn't be set up in that way, but let's be kind of kind to Chalmers and let's suppose that it is set up in this way because it's only if things are set up in this way you could get any sort of tracking of virtual objects. So do we veridically perceive the properties of those data structures? Well, obviously not, right? When you put on the virtual reality, you need to know nothing about computers and data structures and what's going on and so on. You experience pink, jelly-shaped objects in the space in front of you, and there are no pink, jelly-shaped objects in front of you uh, answering to something that's in the computer. Those are simply properties that data structures lack. And of course, likely those properties of the jellyfish being pink, being here, having this shape, will correspond to properties of the data structures. Right, that's, it is these properties here that will be driving the display of different properties on the screen so that we'll be counterfactually sensitive to properties of the data structures. But we won't be accurately representing those properties. We'll be representing really quite different properties, pinkness and the shape of jellyfish and so on and so forth. Now, could we form correct judgments about the properties of the data structures on the basis of taking our experiences of the jellyfish at face value? Well, at best you could form comparative judgments. You might be able to form judgments of the form, this jellyfish is more similar to this jellyfish than it is that jellyfish. Therefore, if you took your experience at face value, you might say, well, you know, really what you're judging is that this data structure is more similar to this data structure than it is to that data structure. So at best you would be doing these kinds of judgments, A is more similar to B than it is to C. At best you could be getting those kinds of judgments correct about the data structures. And as we saw previously, whether that is enough to count this as a case of perception and a case of illusion, or whether we should think of that as a case of illusion, if you remember that was right on the cusp, it's like it, that kind of case divides people. So it's kind of hard to say whether it's illusion or hallucination, but it definitely is illusion and hallucination. You're not accurately seeing the properties of the data structures. Okay. So what, what are we seeing vis-a-vis -vis the properties of the data structures? Well, if you're tracking those data structures accurately, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them and what's on the screen, you're having a veridical perception of those objects qua objects, but you'll either be having illusory or hallucinatory perception of the properties of, of those objects. You're not having veridical perception of the properties of those objects. So that's why we should put two ticks in the box here, qua computational structures. Of course, qua the objects on the screen, we know that we should be putting the boxes in here. And of course, again, we've got this nice explanation of indirect perception. The reason that you are experiencing illusory or hallucinatory in, a, in, a, in an illusory or in a hallucinatory way the properties of the data structures is that you're doing so in virtue of perceiving either accurately or in an illusory fashion the properties of the objects on the screen. So we get to put a nice tick in this indirect perception box. And of course, suppose that you're looking at the screen and thereby seeing data structures and thereby that's actually recorded uh, a real world event of seeing uh, a jellyfish swimming, then you're get, getting this doubly indirect perception, indirect perception. You're seeing the jellyfish in virtue of detecting the computational structure in virtue of detecting the properties on the screen. So you get this hugely complex sort of three lots of objects being perceived in these fashions and of course you've got this double indirect perception going on on the top of that as well. So the conclusion is that virtual reality experience involves a real wide variety of veridical, illusory and hallucinatory elements. 
If you're interested in illusions, I would like to point you towards the Illusions in Index, which we run. And if you're interested in practical VR applications, we are, we are developing virtual reality applications for teaching at the University of Glasgow. Please go to this website and you can see uh, details of those projects there. Thank you very much. First, ask you to define counterfactual, and then ask my real question. Is that permissible? <laughs> of course, I think it is. You would like to know um, the definition of counterfactual that you're using. Yeah. So. Like everything, there are different ways to define counterfactuals, but the standard, the kind of standard thing, is supposed to be something like this. Um, suppose I'm looking at uh, the glass. Okay. What What we want to ask is, if things were as they actually are. In other words, if we were in a counterfactual situation in some way other than the way things are, what we're asking is, um, would my experience update depending on what the counterfactual was? So if we replaced the glass by a pen, would my experience update and now represent the pen as, a, as opposed to representing the glass? So that's, that's the gist of it. Does that satisfy you? Everybody in the audience, not just myself, in that, but for myself, I want to go back to the very beginning and challenge your assertion that the car is really blue when seen under a sodium light isn't. This concept of really blue completely smooths over the fact that the whole matter of color is an interaction between substances that are on the surface of the object and the wavelengths of light that are falling upon it. In really, using the word really, it seems to me you are just implicitly assuming that the normal total spectrum of sunlight is what makes for real colour. Fair comment or not? Very fair comment. I couldn't agree with you more. So, um, for the purposes of this talk, I made a huge simplifying explanation, which were that the properties that we're talking about, like shape and colour and location, are really properties of objects and that we can be accurately or inaccurately picking up on them. And of course, the case of colour is, is one of the hardest cases to actually make out that that's true. Not only because of the different variation in lights, but because of the huge variation in perceptual systems. So some people are colour blind, as you get older, the macula of your eye gets more yellow and you will make different, uh, very subtly different colour judgments. When we start looking at the animal kingdom, we start to see creatures with many more types of eyes and receptors and so on. Uh, even when we look at human perception, as well as people who are being colour blind, they look as if they're like super perceivers who are tetrachromats, who can detect more quality of things. So, absolutely. Um, I was making this huge simplifying assumption that objects really do have colours and we can pick them up or not. What's really interesting about thinking about colour in this more accurate and complicated way that we just are now is there's a real question about whether you can hang on to any sense of veridicality in whilst taking account of different uh, viewing conditions and different perceptual systems. And there are some ways that people do that. So, for example, some people think that objects just have multiple colours at the same time. So, if this pen is both red and if in sodium light it looked pink, let's say this pen is both red and pink. And it's just that on one occasion we're picking up on one colour property of it, accurately so. In another uh, viewing condition, we're seeing another colour pro property of it, but accurately so. And similarly, you can relativise that to perceptual systems. So maybe someone who's colourblind and someone who has normal trichromatic vision are just picking up on different, but nonetheless accurate colour properties of objects. So yes, you're exactly right. I, I skipped over all of that, but my system can, can nicely account for that. Because we can ask, are there any properties that you're really tracking out there or not? We might have to get quite complicated about what those properties are. I've got the back in the blue jumper. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm fifty percent of male, I'm colourblind. Quite a lot, anyway. Yes. I have a brother. 
I have a husband. <laughs> One is so bad he cannot tell the difference between the electric cable which is on and the grass which he's cutting, cutting so he doesn't use a bed, he doesn't use an electric one. <laughs> Having said that, I also very luckily have a granddaughter, Ada, who is three weeks old. Does she have visual perception of a 3D thing? And the answer is probably not because she has to touch it. And what has not been in the lecture is the other senses, touch, smell, taste. So we, we see things in 3D. We don't see 3D in television. Because television is flat. Absolutely. And our vision is 180 degrees. I can't remember what the vertical degrees are, but sure. it's 180 degrees. Yep. And we see things as 3D because we've touched them and we experience it. So if you were to show me a virtual reality of jellyfish, <coughs> unless I'd actually see the jellyfish for real, I have no conception of what it feels like other than it can give me a bad swing. <laughs> go for the purple ones, don't go for the red ones. Okay. <laughs> uh, you want to yeah, absolutely. Down. So um of course, there's lots and lots of topics that I have not covered in this lecture in the slightest. I haven't talked about the development of vision. And there are super interesting questions about to what extent, in order to see, do you have to uh, match up your experience, your visual experience with experiences in other modalities? So very famously, there was Molyneux's question. If a man born blind were made to see, would he be able to judge just by sight the difference between a sphere and a cube? And Molyneux thought, probably not. You'd have to have a good, you'd have to probably have a good feel, first of all. And there's now some good empirical research that suggests, indeed, more or less that's right. So I haven't talked about how it is that we come to perceive in 3D. One of the interesting things about virtual reality compared to TV is that you do have a three-dimensional experience. And indeed, there has been a case of a man who had only two-dimensional experience. He was a neuroscientist in Canada. And he went just to a 3D movie. And he put the glasses on, thinking, this isn't going to work for me. And he actually had an experience of 3D vision for the first time. And it actually persisted once he took off the glasses and left the theatre. And he wrote quite a substantial article about how going to see a 3D movie had uh, cured his 2D vision and given him 3D vision for the first time. So, um, you know, there are a hundred interesting questions that you're asking that I didn't talk about and that I can stand here all night and chat to you about. And we'll go and get a glass of wine and I'm very happy to chat more about all of those. <laughs> Okay, over the uh, black jumper. Yes. Would it make the analysis easier to handle if you started off by defining a hallucination as a perception which cannot be shared, which is purely private, and that reality, which you had perceptions which could be shared, and which can be um, not only shared between people, but can be consensually validated, that then leaves you with the illusion which can be shared, but which cannot be consensually validated. If you use these three starting definitions, perhaps it might not be quite so complicated, but I feel like that reaction. So I don't think that's a good starting point. Why? <laughs> um, here's, here's why. So there's two very different notions of privacy that we might have in mind when we ask the kind of questions that you're asking, and I think it's really important to keep them apart. So in one sense, there's the thought that what goes on in my mind is utterly private to me, and that you can't know really what's going on in my mind. I mean, I can tell you, but I could be lying, right? Um, that there's something very private and special about my own experience. Now, in that sense, in neither the case of hallucination, nor in the case of accurately perceiving the world, is can we share experiences? Each of our experiences is private to ourselves. But now there's another sense of, of private in which you were trying to sort of say something like, well, a hallucination is private because you would just be having the hallucination and other people wouldn't verify it. They wouldn't be undergoing your hallucination. 
But with virtual reality, that's not the case. In virtual reality, I have a 15-person lab where I can put the virtual headset on 15 people and give them all exactly the same visual experience right at the same time where it's not accurate vis-a-vis -vis the world. So in another sense of, of could you be having the same experience, could two people be having the same experience at the same time and it be hallucinatory? The answer is yes. So I don't think that that's a good way of telling apart these questions. And definition of yeah. Like, yeah. It, 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 it does not, you cannot discuss what is really out there. We know, nobody knows what is really out there. So you can forget the first definition of your no. first, you said that. No, so on definition. the first definition, what I was saying was what goes on in your own mind is, is utterly private and can't be shared on that sense. Now, there's a separate question of. Given that we each have our own subjective experience, can we ever know the nature of the world and so on? That's a, that's a different question. And I haven't, I've been assuming that we can perceive the world. I haven't been tackling the sceptical question of do we ever have a right to think that we don't accurately perceive the world? Okay. Uh, we have a question over here. Yeah. Uh, Professor, in the context of, of this lecture, uh, what would you describe? Dreams. So it's a great question. So, um, in the case of dreaming, you you at least seem to have a perceptual experience. That that um, what one thing that's strange about dreams is that when you're in the dream and having the perceptual experience, you don't realise that often a the content's quite weird and that b the content is usually quite diminished in comparison to the typical everyday waking experience. Often, once you wake up. Um, you realise um, that uh, your experience was A, quite bizarre, and that you didn't notice that at the time, and B, was actually quite diminished in, in, in comparison to your standard everyday waking experience. Now, you're shaking your head. It, lots of people have lucid dreams and very, very vivid dreams, and it's true that people can have those, and I'm, I'm certainly not denying that. But there's usually, um, there's often a diminishment in content that you don't notice at the time that you do notice when you wake up. So I would think of dreams as hallucinations of a, of a forum, of a very special forum. And it kind of depends. I mean, there are very, various different theories of what hallucinations are. So some people think that hallucinations are just your own imagination that's mistaken for perception. So that would be one account, and there's lots to say about that account and whether it's any good. I myself think that uh, there's a distinction at least of degree to be made of typical imagery and typical hallucination, and I would say that dream experiences are, are basically like uh, hallucinations, albeit sometimes distorted and weird and odd, and one thing that's unusual is that you don't notice the oddness while you're dreaming, but you do remember it when you wake up. Okay, we've got time uh, for two more questions. This one here, and then... Thank you very much for a very enjoyable talk. This was exempted by the fact that perhaps there'll be nobody apart from the ambient of the tunnels. <laughs> nobody else appears to have left. However, we had a discussion last weekend about the validity, illusory, and hallucinatory. However, I feel that we, in the interview with this gentleman, that we've missed the real point of the lecture, and that is the definition of virtual. You talked about virtual reality in terms of seeing Jerry Fish when you put the, the things on. And I, I expected to come along and have it more focused, lecture more focused on the virtual aspect of it. Whereas I think the problem with the data comparison and Mr. Charles is that you are comparing a virtual creation, a data creation, with an actual experience. And we really should have defined virtual before we started all the other definitions. Thank you. Um, I guess one thing that I wanted to do was kind of leave that question deliberately open because my question was if I took a stance in advance about the nature of, of the virtual, suppose I said, the virtual is merely virtual and it's not real at all, then I couldn't say that our experience was accurate vis-a-vis -vis it, because if it's not real, if it doesn't really exist, we're not, the question of accuracy doesn't even arise. If I had said, the virtual is really real and of course we're seeing virtual reality, I would have 
taken a stance and said, well, we really are accurately seeing these virtual objects. And that was precisely the question that I wanted to leave open. Now, when we looked at the Chalmers quotes that I put up, what he showed us was that the view that the virtual is real goes hand in hand with the view that you're really accurately seeing something. And the view that the virtual is not real goes hand in hand with it's just an illusion or a hallucination. And the point of my talk was to say, it's not just one or the other, it's a really deep and complex mix of those things. And so I would say that in a way, the, the virtual is a really complex mix of the really virtual and the really real. Okay, so we have to... Sorry, we have to... We have more time for one more question. Uh, I'm just following on. Well, can you... Who's got a microphone? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good evening. Really, just following on from the dream question, so yep. how would memory or imagination or perceptual experiences fit into your screen because they're not they're things that we do all the time they're not really one could see them weird circumstances but I think a lot of features that you were talking about in some ways on the same crack you could perhaps use the same criteria to judge something yeah so Typically when people have at least sensory imagery and sensory imagination, then you have an experience that, as David Hume said, is less vivid and less lively than a perceptual experience. Now what is really meant by those terms is a hugely interesting question and something I think that has really been under underexplored. But people recognise that there's a similarity in imagery and memory experiences and perceptual experiences. And then there's a question of, well, if your perceptual experience gives you typically knowledge of the way the world is, what does memory experience give you? Well, if it's accurate, it gives you knowledge of the way the world was in the past. And then what does imagination give you? And philosophers have often said, imagination can give you knowledge of what's possible. Right? If I visually imagine a golden mountain, I mean, there isn't a golden mountain, at least to my knowledge, um, there wasn't one in the past, but what I'm doing is creating something that I know could exist, right? You get a lot of gold and make it into a mountain. So um, there's interesting questions about whether imagination can give you actual knowledge of the present. So for example, um, if I lifted up my computer and I held it, I could probably imagine that I could get it through the door there just fine. Uh, so maybe your imagination can tell you about uh, how things um, about how things are vis-a-vis -vis certain of their properties, like their shape and the fact that you could be able to get the computer through the door. Okay, uh, we have to stop there. Just before I thank uh, Fiona for her lecture, I'll just remind you that the next lecture is on the 4th of March and it's on electronic skin. I don't know if that's real or virtual skin. <laughs> Um, the refreshments are available. Uh, I'll just now thank you, the audience. And I'd also like to thank Fiona very much for dealing with really quite a complicated topic. Uh, when I came, I thought I knew what reality was. Uh, there are certain things I hope weren't real. Um, <laughs> Or, well, no. Uh, now, um, you're not so sure. I'm not so sure <laughs> about illusions and hallucinations, and I think that's what you're trying to prompt us to think that it isn't as straightforward as we all saw. So, join me, please, in thanking Fiona very much.